everyone welcome back to fpl fran today's video is going to be a video on how to play fpl there are multiple segments towards the game what i'll go through first is the starting aspect of the game so from game week one what you're allowed to do in terms of budget and information i'll then talk about point scoring within the game i will then move to the aspect of chips in the game and then the aspect of fixture planning and fixture strategy Starting from game week one, you will effectively be entrusted with a 100 million budget to create a team within FPL. This team has to be a team of two goalkeepers, five defenders, five midfielders, and three forwards. The way things will work is that each week you will have to field a team using the team you started from game week one, and that team will have to have a starting 11 and a bench. So the starting 11 will be comprised of one goalkeeper, three to five defenders, five midfielders and one to three forwards if you try to create a formation that is illegal you will unfortunately not be able to play so the formation has to have as i said a minimum of three defenders a minimum of three forwards a minimum of three midfielders and a minimum of one forward three five two or three four three are generally the most common formations that you tend to see within fantasy premier league because the point scoring is a little bit more geared towards the attackers so midfielders and forwards tend to benefit the most and unfortunately defenders tend to benefit the least and they also get neglected because unfortunately a lot of goals get scored in the premier league and they don't benefit too much from that so the key thing with the formation as i said is most people try to create a team that is geared around a 3-5-2 or 3-4-3 but as, as I told you at the start, you have a starting 11 and a bench. What does the bench do? The bench has effectively two primary purposes. If let's say you have a starter within your team and that's within your outfield team, right? There's starters in your goalkeepers and starters within your outfield team. If your goalkeeper is not ready to play, let's say he got ill, what will happen is that your bench goalkeeper will get auto-subbed. And let's say in game week one, we use the example of let's say Ederson in game week one. If for whatever reason he gets ill, uh, and your backup goalkeeper is, let's say, someone like Matt Turner from Nottingham Forest, who's unlikely to start for Nottingham Forest. What will happen is Matt Turner will replace Ederson. But unfortunately, Matt Turner is unlikely to play, so you won't get any additional points. However, if your backup goalkeeper is someone who does play, let's say your backup goalkeeper is Stefan Ortega, you will get the points that Stefan Ortega plays in place of Ederson because Ederson, as long as he doesn't play a single minute within the match, will not get points and your first goalkeeper will get auto-subbed. Generally speaking, in terms of budget, people tend to spend the least amount of money within the goalkeeping position. Goalkeepers also tend to fortunately get injured the least. So a lot of people have been able to benefit from simply having a starting goalkeeper and a 4.0 goalkeeper in the past. If you want to try rotation, 4.5 plus 4.5 goalkeepers are a strategy that some people like to go with. Two starting goalkeepers, that is. And ultimately, as I said, it really comes down to your preference, but you can even go for premium goalkeepers at the 5.5 position. In terms of your outfield players, though, if you let's say have a player who's missing in any position, what needs to happen, however, is that your auto sub has to create a legal formation. So let's say you have a 3-5-2. Unfortunately, one of your defenders is ill. So let's say Alexander Arnold is ill and Trent is not able to play. If that's the case and your first sub is a midfielder, so your first sub could be Harry Winks, a 4.5 midfielder from Leicester. Um, unfortunately, he will not sub for Trent Alexander-Arnold if you are fielding a 3-4-3. So what will actually happen in this situation is that your first defender within your bench gets auto-subbed for Trent to recreate a legal formation. If, let's say, Trent was not the one who was missing and, and maybe within your midfield position there was another player who was ill, Harry Winks, as your first substitution, will immediately sub on. So that is the intricacy of the auto-sub mechanic within the game. It really depends on whether your goalkeeper is out or whether your outfield player is out and whether you have a legal formation. As I said, the most popular formations tend to be based around back threes. But the second use of the bench is actually around rotation. So let's say you plan to generally have a 3-4-3 every week or a 3-5-2. Um, the key thing is maybe if you have eight attackers, so let's say you have someone like Morgan Rogers, a 5.0 midfielder, and you have someone like, let's say, Adam Armstrong, a 5.5 mid forward. 
you can actually quite often rotate between these two players and they can be your seventh and eighth attackers. And you can therefore sort of switch formation every week between a 3-5-2 and a 3-4-3. Another aspect of rotation that comes into place is the sort of three defenders. Your third and fourth defender could very well be two 4.5 defenders and they can rotate for each other's bad fixtures. As we tend to say, the premium defenders are quite strong. They tend to get more clean sheets. So therefore, they're, they also tend to get played more often. However, let's say a 4.5 defender from, let's say, Crystal Palace or Everton, they will have more bad fixtures than the premium ones, and they might need to be rotated in and out. A good example is the rotation here between Mikolenko and Anderson at the start of the season. As you can see, you can tend to, for example, bench Mikolenko on the bad game weeks and Anderson on the bad game weeks between game weeks one, two, six. So that's just a, a good introduction of why you might want to have a bench sometimes. Rotation can be strong, and you might also want to ensure that your team is a little bit more robust so when you have injuries, when you have issues, your bench can come in to save the week. How does point scoring generally work though? Point scoring works as such. There are points for appearing within a football match. As soon as you appear on the field, whether as a substitute or as a starter, you get one point. If you play for up to 60 minutes within a match, you get another point. So in total, there are two points for appearing within a football match, as long as you can play 60 minutes a game. This is why it's generally speaking, preferential to get players who start games and who and players who also play for more than 60 minutes a match. It's also very impactful in terms of clean sheet points. We'll talk about that in a moment. As far as goals scored, this is the most important metric probably within the game. For a goal scored by a goalkeeper, you get 10 points. That was a change for this season. For a goal scored by a defender, that's six points. A midfielder, that's five points. A forward, that's four points. For each assist, regardless of the position that you play in, it's always going to be three points. For a clean sheet, and what is a clean sheet? A clean sheet is effectively if you play for more than 60 minutes within a match and you keep a clean sheet whilst you're still on the field, you will get four points if you are a goalkeeper or a defender. If you're a midfielder, you will only get one point for a clean sheet. Unfortunately, if you appear within a match, you play for more than 60 minutes and you suddenly concede at, let's say, the 70 minute and you're still on the field, you will lose your clean sheet points. However, if you, let's say, play 60 minutes, you get subbed off at 68 minutes and your team concedes at 70 minutes, you will keep those clean sheet points. So sometimes it can actually work in the opposite direction. However, as I said, generally speaking, you still want to be a player who plays for probably more than 60 minutes a match uh, because it definitely does give you guarantees in terms of more chances to get positive actions like, let's say, assists, goals scored, and things like that. For every three shots that you save as a goalkeeper, you get one point. For each penalty save that you make as a goalkeeper, you get five points. If you're an attacker uh, or even a defender or goalkeeper who takes penalties, if you miss a penalty, you get minus two points. There is a bonus point system in the game, and the way it works is every match, let's say a, a match between Man City and Ipswich, there will be some bonus points awarded at the end of the match, and that depends on this thing called BPS. BPS stands for bonus point system. And if it effectively is a tally of positive actions and negative actions within a match. Um, I'm not going to explain them all here, but a good example of a positive action is a shot on target. A good example of a negative action is something like a yellow card. So as long as you accumulate these positive actions, you also have to accumulate them against an aggregate of negative actions. And the net of the two will actually lead you to potentially getting bonus points within a certain match between one point to three points. So this is usually attributed to three point three players within a certain football match. Um, however, sometimes if players will land on the same amount of BPS, they could also get both, let's say one points per match, both two points per match or both three points per match. And that's very specific, but it can happen from time to time. As I said, a lot of things like chance created, chance created, chances created do tend to help with bonus point accumulation. So there is an aspect of the game where you get benefited for taking set piece takers, right? People who take corners, people who take indirect free kicks will tend to create a lot more chances and that can also rack up a lot of BPS, which will lead to eventual bonus points. As far as every two goals you concede, if you're a goalkeeper or defender, you will get minus one point. So clearly, as you can see, there is a bit of a preference towards having premium defenders in the game because you're less likely to concede more than two goals per match. And at the same time, you're also more likely to keep clean sheets. However, the general goal scoring or, or negative points that you'll get for any player is minus one for a yellow card, minus three for a red card, and minus two for an own goal. 
The key thing is that if you, let's say, have a red card as well, you will also concede additional points for every two goals you concede within a match. So that's actually a big negative for being someone who actually gets a red card. And that's practically how the point system works. As I said, it is a little bit more favored towards the attackers in the game. So it does make sense to, generally speaking, um, try to spend that 100 million more within the attackers and that's pretty much it. The most important thing about starting every single game week is the captaincy element of the game. Every week you'll have a captain and a vice captain. For each game week, you'll get to select a captain uh, and a vice captain, and that player's points, mostly the captaincy, will be doubled. If your captain is someone who unfortunately fell ill, what happens is the captaincy minus or the the multiplication of the captaincy points gets shifted on towards your vice captain and your vice captain actually gets double points instead. So a good example is let's say if Holland was your captain for game week 1, he is suddenly miraculously ill after the deadline, your vice captain was Salah, therefore Salah will get double the points and you will get an auto sub for Holland instead. So that's practically how the point scoring works. The next most important part is the chip strategy element of the game and just in general the chips um, in game week one you have unlimited transfers you also have a budget of 100 million later in the game there will be a thing called price rises there will be price falls as well so players based on performances will usually get transferred in and transferred out uh, depending on whether the general populace would like to have a player within our team or whether they'd like to take a player out if a player gets mass transferred in it's more than likely that they'll get a price rise if a player gets mass transferred out, it's more than likely they'll get a price fall. Price rises and falls are interesting because if you own a player who gets a price rise, you don't actually get to sell that price rise until a player gets two price rises in a row. So a good example is this. Mo Salah is 12.5 million. If he actually gets a price rise to 12.6 million, his sell value on your team is still going to be 12.5 million. You can only sell Mo for a bit of profit if he actually rises to 12.7 million because you can only bank a price rise every 0.2 million a price for every 0.2 million worth of price rises, which means that Mo Salah needs to get two price rises. He needs to be 12.7 million on the market and on your team, he will be so able to be sold for 12.6 million. Uh, and that's unfortunately how the game works. But the easy way to check the sell value of a certain player within your team or the transfer value of a player within a team is to quickly go on the FPL app or the FPL website to go to your team on the transfer page and to click on the list function. The list feature will show you the current price of the player. So the market price of the player, it will also show you the selling price of the player. So what you can sell the player for back to the market effectively and the purchase price of the player. So what you originally bought the player for. Unfortunately, if you accumulate a lot of price rises, your total team value will fall. If you accumulate a lot of price rises, your team value will rise. So that 100 million budget does change throughout the season and you need to be wary of that. What I would recommend, generally speaking, is not to just chase price rises for the sole purpose of chasing price rises. You want to ensure that when you're actually buying a player, that you're buying a player that you think will be additive to your team and conducive to getting more points. The name of the game is getting more points each week and accumulating as many points as possible. So you don't want to be just chasing price rises because that doesn't actually give you any additional points within the game. Although later down the season, we've done a, a or we, there are FPL studies that show that generally speaking, price rises do lead to better team value in the season. And when you get to use your wildcard chips, which I'll talk about in a moment, you will probably be able to get a little bit more value based on that wildcard. So what is a wildcard chip? The wildcard chip is the strongest chip in the game. You actually get two wildcard chips within a single season of FPL. You get one within the first half of the season, so game weeks 1 to 20, and then another that you can use for the exact same purpose and reason after game week 20. And the way that the wildcard works is that you get to, very much like game week 1, have unlimited transfers using the budget that your team has. So depending on the price rises and falls that you pocket within your team, that will be your budget by the time you activate a wild card. You could, for example, activate the wild card on game week six, and that will allow you to use as many unlimited transfers as possible. The main change this season is that if you activate your wild card, let's say on game week five, and you haven't used any free transfers, on game week four, you would have had three, three transfers. On game week five, you don't have the fourth three transfer, but you would wild card. And then on game week six, 
um, after that wildcard week, you'd actually have four free transfers. So that's the main change in the season. You can actually roll up to five free transfers at any one point in time, and you can also roll those free transfers throughout a chip. That chip can be a wild card or the three hit chip. Um, so that's the wild card chip. The free hit chip is a one time use of a certain free hit only team. And the way it works is you will use a restricted budget of 100 million to have a unlimited transfer team for that one week only. What will happen is after that one week is over, your team goes back to the team it was the week before. And whatever save transfers you had the week before the free hit gets accumulated and rolled over towards the week after the free hit. So very much like the wild card scenario, if you, let's say, decided to free hit on game week five, you would end up with, let's say, four three transfers in game week six if you decided not to use any free transfers within the season. And that's the free hit chip. What's beneficial about the wild card and the free hit in the second half of the season and particularly saving it for then is unfortunately there is a fixture element in the game called blank game weeks and double game weeks. And, and this is usually created around, you know, necessities around, let's say, European cup fixture scheduling and also FA cup fixture scheduling. That means that for whatever reason, sometimes, let's say, a team involved within a certain cup will have their matches postponed because they have advanced deep into a certain competition. And that means on, on some weeks or, or some match weeks, you'll see that a, a team plays two weeks uh, or two fixtures, which is called a double game week, or a team will not have a fixture at all, which is called a blank game week. Tentatively, what I would say is that this usually applies to some of the better teams. So Man City, Arsenal, Man United, you tend to see double game weeks for these teams or blank game weeks as well, because unfortunately they advance quite deep into competitions or not unfortunately rather, but they just tend to. And, and that creates a fixture ups and that creates a fixture scheduling issue for the Premier League. And that means that some of their fixtures have to be played um, in a double game week or, to sing or, or unfortunately they leave blank game weeks in the midst. And the best way to sort of fixture plan around that is to have wild cards or to once again with this season use the road free transfers that you have up to five or to use free hits so for example let's say you have a team that is you know filled with arsenal players filled with man city players you want to keep that team in place but there's a blank gaming for man city and arsenal which means that these players won't play the best way to sort of paper over the cracks is to use a free hit potentially if you want or of course you can use a free hit on the exact opposite. So you can use a free hit in a double game week. Let's say Crystal Palace like last season have a double game week. Let's say Everton have a double game week. You can actually use to use a free you can actually use a free hit on that window to sort of bolster the amount of double game week players you have and to in theory cr increase the ceiling of your team if you want. And so it really depends on the fixture scheduling and and the FA Cup impacts. This season what we have already been communicated by the Premier League is that there will be less double game weeks and less blank game weeks. So that shouldn't be too hard to manage, but once again, we will make videos around that time, so don't feel too scared about it. We will manage it accordingly. The last piece in terms of chip strategy is going to be the mystery chip. The mystery chip is a new chip feature that was released this season. Unfortunately, we have no details about it. We'll find out before January um, 2025, and I will give you more details then. As far as the traditional chips that I haven't uncovered, it's the bench boost and the triple captaincy. The bench boost is effectively a, a chip where you get to get the points accumulated from your bench within a certain week. So every week you only get the points accumulated from your starting 11. However, if you have the bench boost chip activated, you will also get the points accumulated by anyone sitting on your bench. So generally speaking, you probably want to only use and activate the bench boost when you actually have a team of strong 15 players for a specific game week. Um, sometimes you'll have to take hits for that to happen and hits are effectively when you overuse the amount of free transfers that you have and you dip into additional transfers, which actually cost you minus four points. So hits are also explained within this segment of the video. As far as the last piece, it's the triple captaincy. Triple captaincy is effectively the same thing as a regular captaincy, but you basically triple the captain's points within a certain game week. As I said, if your captaincy misses out on that week, um, it just gets rolled over to your vice captain and then your vice captain gets their points tripled up. As far as the triple captaincy chip, the key thing here is that double game weeks do exist. And so 
logically speaking, the best opportunity to use triple captaincies are when there are double game weeks. And that's the, the key thing. I would also like to say that bench boosts in the past have traditionally also been used in double game weeks. But because we expect the amount of double game weeks to reduce this season, we might have to be a little bit more calculative of when we tend to use these chips. But fixture strategy and also chip strategy always changes each season. So the most important thing is to follow fixture planners like someone like Ben Krellen, who you can find on Twitter, and he will give you the lay of the land. And, and of course, um, I will try to cover what strategies we have in place at each season. As far as, let's say, the double game weeks and blanks aspect of the game, that only really happens in the second half of the season. Sometimes some ridiculous things can create blanks or double game weeks in the first half of the season. Last season, we had Luton with a blank game week, for example, and a double game week at the start, but that is very uncommon. But that will be situational, and sometimes we tend to see it as well, for example, in a season like within one of the COVID seasons in the past. But once again, it's not that significant until the second half of the season, usually speaking. And that's pretty much it for how to play FPL. What I would say, generally speaking, from my advice, when it comes to creating a team uh, and planning a team, it's always tried to keep in mind of the fixture slate. So what I tend to do is place more importance in terms of the immediate fixtures. So game weeks one, game weeks two, game weeks three, and place a little bit less importance on game weeks four, five, and six. Because generally speaking, you want to have a team that, you know, does well in the short term, and hopefully you have free transfers to try and address issues coming later down the line. What is important though is that you don't lose sight of those fixtures coming later down the line because you want to make sure that your team is not geared towards one game week. The point is these players are trying to accumulate points over multiple game weeks and you should also pack practice patience. Patience is very important. Things don't tend to repeat itself unless it's very common or very normal. So it, for Erling Haaland, whilst it might be normal for him to score a goal every single match, unfortunately, it's not common for any other player in the Premier League to score a goal every single match. So if you, let's say you own Cole Palmer and he's blanked in game week one versus Man City, you do not need to sell Cole Palmer in game week two. What you probably should do is assess whether you think Cole Palmer is still a good player. And if he is, more than likely, you've picked him for a good reason and you've picked him for more than game week one versus Man City. So practice patience with your players let them bear out the results that you expect them to do. If they really don't do well, if they get injured, yes, of course, you have to address these issues, but try to practice patience because taking hits in this game is usually not beneficial. And you also get additional free transfers this season that you can roll up, right? Not additional free transfers in the sense that you get more free transfers, but just in the sense that you don't need to burn free transfers, for, for example, you get to roll your transfers and you can practice patience as well through that. If you're a bit of an aggressive manager, this is also an opportunity to you know look at the short term as well. But I would never try to go for hits early in the season, if possible, unless you have a lot of injuries in place, because hits can be very, very damaging for the points accumulation. The, the name of the game is to maximize the amount of points you have. Maybe around the double game week time of the season, you might want to take hits because in theory, if you think about it, if you have if you go from a single game week player to a double game week player, um, just by appearing within a game for more than 60 minutes within the second fixture, that, that player can actually get two points and the net loss for taking a hit is minus two. But that's generally speaking, a little bit of an insight into the later half of the season. Otherwise, enjoy creating your first drafts. I will be supporting you guys every step of the way. Uh, by creating some cheat sheets as well. So look forward to that and enjoy the season of FPL.